All right, take your Bibles, go to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to actually hit several passages of Scripture this morning. I also encourage you to go to the app. We've provided some notes on the app for you so that you can fill in the blanks, and then you can email those notes to yourself. If you like to go old school, take out a pen, piece of paper, but I really want you to write some things down. And if you missed last week, we launched into a summer-long series last week that we're calling In Season. And this is an in-depth study of the fruit of the Spirit, where week by week we're going to be uh, examining these different aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, really the goal is not that we just increase our biblical knowledge. The goal is that we display the character of who God really is to a watching world. And I really hope that, you know, as I have said often, if you're in town, be in a seat this summer. And if you are out of town, uh, take time, block out a little time, and join us. Connect with us online, different platforms that we've made available, Facebook Live, the Refuge app, the website, all of that. You can join us live for that. Now, if you missed last week, uh, I I just want to give you just a very quick, brief review of some of the things we hit on. And if you were here, it won't hurt you to hear it again because these were things that were so important in laying the foundation from where we're going to go this summer and the things that are so vital to us really kind of embracing this concept of the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee. He sees two guys, Peter and Andrew, and he calls out to them and says, hey, follow me. That's our job. Follow me, Jesus said. And then Jesus said this, and I will make you. That's his job. So our job is to pursue him. Our job is to follow him. And if we'll do the following, he'll do the making. Like the pressure's on him. If we'll pursue him, if we'll go after him, then Jesus will be faithful to produce in us the character of who God really is. So I I made this statement last week, and it's really important that you get this, that you understand this. And the statement was this, that if you are not intentionally being discipled, by Jesus, you will unintentionally be discipled by the world. If you're not intentionally being discipled by Jesus, key word, intentionally. Like if you're intentionally being discipled by Jesus, great. But if not, you'll unintentionally be discipled by the world. The word there that we find in Galatians 5, we're going to read these passages in a moment. The Greek word for fruit is the word karpos, And it generally refers to character, but it also refers to anything done in true partnership with Christ. And here's the thing you need to know. You and I do not have the ability to display the character of God without the help of the Holy Spirit. So you have to have this partnership with Him. And that only comes through relationship. That doesn't come through some one-time experience, but it comes through this journey, this lifelong journey, and this partnership with Him. And that the more you know Him, the more you're able to convey and display the character of who God is. Jesus says in John 15, verse 1, I'm the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Cuts it off. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Anybody ever mistaken the pruning of the Lord as the anger of God? Somehow, like you're pruned and you're like, hey, whoa, what did I do wrong? And it might be that you did nothing wrong, but you're doing everything right. And the Lord sees fruit being produced. And he's like, wow, that's awesome. I love the way that looks. And I want to give the ability to do that more. So let me cut off, let me trim off some branches and prune your life just a little bit so that you can be even more fruitful. And we also said last week that a disciple is an apprentice. And the concept of an apprentice is they would uh, really follow somebody to learn whatever it was that that person was good at. That the ultimate goal of that apprentice was not to reproduce a skill, but it was to reproduce a person. And that should be our goal as well, that we journey, we pursue, we follow Jesus and that the goal in doing so is that we, pr- we reproduce who Jesus is to a watching world. Like we're going to reproduce him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I s- shared this quote last week. I love it. Probably going to share it many times throughout this series, but Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. 
Let me say it again. Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. You need to understand, you need to know walking in the Spirit is not a one-time experience, but it's a lifelong relationship. It's a way of life. It's this journey of relationship where you're, you're learning who He is. You're learning His voice. You're learning what moves His heart. You're learning His way so that then you can display the fruit of who He is. Now, notice this now. That Paul says in Galatians 5, and we're going to read it in a moment, that it's the fruit of the Spirit, singular fruit, not the fruits of the Spirit. That's really important for you to understand. Here's why. Because if it were plural, if it were the fruits of the Spirit, now I've got nine different fruits laid out on this table, but here's what you and I would do if it were individual, if it were the fruits of of the Spirit. We would approach it like we do when we go into the produce section of a grocery store, and we would say, oh, wow, look at this. There's some joy. I need some more joy in my life. I'll put that in my basket. I'll take some joy, but oh, there's self-control. I think I'll leave that for somebody else. I don't like that. I don't like that fruit. Oh, peace? Wow. Man, I need some peace for sure. Gentleness, no thank you. We would leave it for other people. We would pick and choose, right? Come on, let's be honest. We would pick and choose the attributes of God that we thought we wanted the most. But let me tell you something. It's not individual. It's fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. It's a package deal. It all comes together. It's not one. You don't pick and choose. It all comes together, and it's nine different attributes of who God is. Now, let me tell you this. If you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you have all nine attributes inside of you. Now, some might need to be developed a little more than others, right? Come on, how many of you can? That's, that's why this thing is called in season. Because there might be attributes in your life that are not fully developed and they're not in season yet, but it doesn't mean that we can hide behind some excuse and say, well, that person is just naturally joyful. And that doesn't come easy for me, so, you know, I'm going to leave that for somebody else and I'll focus on the peace side of things. No, it does not work that way. It is a package deal. And you have every attribute of God inside of you already. Our responsibility is that we develop all nine attributes so that the people around us get an accurate picture of who God is based on the way you live your life. Come on, are you with me? So Galatians chapter 5, let's look. Stand if you will. I read these verses last week, and uh, we'll probably read them every week. We just got to get them in our spirit. Galatians chapter 5, Paul's writing, beginning in verse 16 now, he says some very powerful things. He says this, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. How many of you would be honest enough to say that I'm very familiar with the cravings of the sinful nature? Come on. That's all of us. We understand that language of Paul. We understand what the cravings of the sinful nature are. Then he says the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit, capital S, wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. The, watch, these two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you're not free to carry out your good intentions. I heard the story uh, one time of this young Indian boy, young boy, who went to the tribal chief, a w- wise, elderly man, and he said, I, I don't understand. He said, I, I keep doing bad things. He said, I don't want to do bad things, but I keep doing bad things. And the chief said, he said, there are are two wolves that are battling on the inside of you. One is dark and one is light. 
He said they're constantly battling to control your life. And the little boy said, well, which one will win? And the chief said, the one that you feed. You see, you have a choice. You can feed your flesh or you can feed your spirit. And whichever one you feed is the one that's going to dominate your life. So Paul goes on to say, but when you're directed by the Spirit, you're not under obligation to the law of Moses. Verse 19, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear or obvious. You might think you're fooling people, but they're, they're clear. They're going to be seen. He said, it, it looks like this, sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties. And then there's just that disclaimer there. Paul's like, in, in case I left something out. And other sins like these. He just throws everything else into the category. And he says, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, listen, this is serious. I need you to understand, this is serious. It's not some just a little cute summer series. Like really, if we do not tame the cravings of the flesh and learn to be led by the Holy Spirit, what Paul is saying to the church at Galatia is this, you will not go to heaven. You will not go to heaven. Like it's serious business. You will not go to heaven. Paul's saying, listen, we've got to pursue Jesus. We've got to learn to walk step in, in stride for stride, step by step with the person of the Holy Spirit. And then the good news, verse 22, he says, if you do this, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit, singular, the package deal. He produces this in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And that's where we'll spend the next nine weeks. One by one. One by one. Just going through these. Now, look, you're smart people. You can look on the calendar. You can figure out, oh, I know. On week so-and-so, he's going to talk about self-control. I think I'll skip out that week. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can figure it out. You can go because we're just going week by week. You know, we're just in order. We're not mixing it up. We could have. Try to keep you guessing. Oh, what week is he going to talk about gentleness? But we didn't do it. Just in order. But let me tell you, if you intentionally skip out, I'm praying the worst stomach bug on you that you've ever seen in your life. I'm just telling you. You think you're going to be out on the lake somewhere? No, you're going to be hugging a toilet somewhere because you're going to have a... All right, before you see that, let's make some declarations. Everybody nice and strong. You ready? Go. I will hide this word in my heart that I might not sin against God. This word is life to my body and health to my bones. I will be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. And I am confident of this, that he who has begun a good work in me will complete it in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. 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 You can be seated. All right, write some things down. Love, that's the one we're talking about this week, the attribute. Remember, it's not an individual fruit. It's the attribute. It's a package deal. It's, it all goes together. And some of you may be knocking it out of the park when it comes to love. Others might be struggling in this area, but all of us have room for improvement. There are four different types of love that we're most familiar with that we find in the Bible. Number one is this, eros in the Greek, eros. That refers to erotic love, sexual love, passionate love. Number two, storge. That's family love. Family love, moms, dads, husbands, wives, children, Number three, phileo in the Greek. And that refers to that brotherly love, that fondness, that affection that focuses on giving and receiving. Giving and receiving, phileo. And then the fourth type of love that we find in Scripture that we're most familiar with is the noblest word for love in the Greek language. It's the word agape. It's a God love. It's a love of esteem. 
It's a love that delights in giving without expecting anything in return. It's a love that desires only the good of the one that's being loved. It's, it's, it's this consuming passion for the well-being of the other person. Uh, the Helps Word Study says that it's a love which centers, watch, in moral preference. A love which centers in moral preference. It's a divine love. And watch, it's a love that prefers the things that God prefers. That's what that means, moral preference. It prefers the things that God prefers. So when we read in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, it's the word agape. It's not phileo, it's not storge, it's not eros, it's agape in the Greek. It refers to that God type of love that gives without expecting anything returned. It's that agape love, that love that says, I only care about the well-being of the other person, and not just because I like them, but because this is the way God would treat them. It's that agape love. That's what Paul's talking about in Galatians chapter 5. Not only do we find it there, we find it in 1 Corinthians 13. What many people would know as the love chapter. I've done hundreds, hundreds of weddings. I wish I would have kept count 35 years. Hundreds of weddings. And in many of those weddings, I've read at least some of the verses out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I won't read them all right now, but I do want to read some of them where Paul writes this, if I could speak all the languages of love and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I'd be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now, every time we just read the word love in the Greek, it's agape. Every single one was agape. So it kind of takes on a little more depth for us if we substitute the word agape. Now, keep in mind the meaning of agape. It's that God type of love that prefers what God prefers and that gives without expecting anything return. And Paul says this, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels but didn't agape others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had such faith that I could move mountains but I didn't agape others, I'd be nothing. I could give my body, I could give everything to the poor, but if I didn't have agape, I would have gained nothing. He says agape is patient and kind. Agape is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It doesn't demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice. Agape never gives up, never loses faith. Agape will last forever. Agape. Preferring what God prefers. I wish that I could say in, in our 36 years of marriage that I had always agaped Melanie. But I can't say that to be true. Would you come up here for a moment, sweetheart? Would you give a big hand to the first lady, the amazing <laughs> pastor mom? So let, let me just... Let me just paint a fictitious conversation that we might would have in our marriage. Let, let's just say one day that I'm going through the mail and uh, I'm opening the bills and I open the TJ Maxx bill. Just fictitious. <laughs> open the TJ Maxx bill, I pull out the bill and I'm looking, and, and you know, of course, immediately I'm looking at you know, what's owed, and what's the due date. So I look at that, and I just go, wow. Like, 
what in the world happened? And then I start looking at the itemized things, and I'm like, so we've got 33 pillows on the bed already. Why did we need more pillows? <laughs> Can any men in the place feel my pain? Yeah. New pictures, we've got some clothes, we got, you know, and, and whatever. So I'm going through that, and I'm, I'm, you know, like, I'm feeling a little bit of hostility about the bill. By the way, my wife and I have a little agreement. I told her, whenever the day comes that I die, I want you to bury me in front of TJ Maxx, because that way I know you'll come see me every day. <laughs> Agape. Yes, I'm not feeling it. All right. <laughs> 36 years I've had with this amazing woman. So here's what agape love would look like. All right, I've got the bill in hand, and I'm looking at all this stuff, and it's like a lot, and I'm frustrated, but agape love is like this. Hey, babe, hey, I wanted to talk to you about this for just a minute because... Like, I opened it up, and I was really surprised. I mean, there's a lot of stuff, and we're trying to stay in the budget and you know, trying to be good stewards, and I just wonder if we could just talk about this. Like, could you help me just understand some of this stuff, or can you maybe, you know, we got all this. Can, can we tighten up in some other areas so we can make sure, you know, that we do this? Because agape love is like her heart matters to me more than the bill, right? And agape love is like I prefer what God prefers, and this is God's daughter, so I need to be careful in how I treat her. Now, again, I, I would love to be able to say in 36 years of marriage that I've always agape her. That's not been true. Not been true. That would be great if that was my response every single time, agape love. I wish that were the case. But there have been times that it was maybe more like this. I open the bill, look at it. Wow. Oh, my gosh, more pillows. Why do we need another comforter? Why do we need more pictures? And as I'm looking down the list, the blood starts to boil. I feel the temperature rising. Like I feel it creeping up my neck into my face, and I'm getting more and more frustrated as I'm thinking about this. And I take the bill, and I say, hey, babe, we need to talk about this. I want to tell you something about it. Like, I don't understand. Can you explain some of this to me and talk to me about, like, why do we need more of these pictures? And by the way, I don't understand why you feel like we've got to do this. We're trying to stay on a budget. Now. Now listen to me. It, it, whatever it is in life could be between spouses. It could be a parent with a child. It could be a co-worker. It could be a neighbor. It could be a total stranger. And you don't approach it with agape love. Paul says, that's what you sound like to that person. They're not going to hear a thing that you have to say. Because the Bible says, we speak truth. I might have been telling her the truth about the, the, the TJ Maxx bill. But if I don't do it with agape, it's like I'm just some noise-making, clanging symbol, and she's never going to hear anything that I say. So as a, as a, a people of God who want to de develop and display the agape of the Lord, we have to keep in mind that in approaching people, like we have to prefer what God prefers. We have to treat them the way that God would treat them. Otherwise, they're not going to hear anything that we have to say. So here's the thing. How's agape love produced? How do we display this kind of love to a watching world? First John chapter 4. Now, let's look there beginning in verse 7. And it says this, dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. 
God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Anybody thankful for that? Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. Again there, 1 John chapter 4, all of those verses that we just read, every time we read the word love in the Greek, it's the word agape. So now let's go back and read it again. Not all of it, but some of it, dear friends. Let us continue to agape one another. For agape comes from God. That's the source. If we want to know how to produce that, if we want to know how to grow in that, display that, the source is God. Anyone who agapes is a child of God and knows God. Anyone who agapes is a child of God and knows God. Question for you. How can we do something we don't know? Let me give you an example. How can I do calculus if I don't know calculus? How can I speak Portuguese if I don't know Portuguese? How can we agape if we don't know agape? How can we agape people and love people the way he tells us that we're to love them if we don't know God? Now, verse 8, he gives us the negative counterpart to what he just said in verse 7. Look at verse 8. But anyone who does not agape does not know God, for God is agape. Anyone who does not agape does not know God, for God is agape. What's the implication here? It's this. If I know God, I've been born of God, and this will lead to a... a an agape love for other people. Now, the fact is this. You cannot be in a relationship with God, a real loving relationship with Him, without being transformed into a loving person. And I would say this to you. If you're in a relationship with God, but your love capacity is not increasing over time, you need to examine your relationship with God. Because you might have more religion than you do relationship. Because if you're really in relationship with Him, your capacity is going to increase. Your agape is going to increase. And since agape is action, it's not an ideal. It's not a philosophy. It's an action. Therefore, agape must exist in the form of action. That's what God modeled for us. When he agaped us so much that he gave his son Jesus, it it, it was the verb sense of the word agape. And we don't just become agape love through one experience, but rather through relationship. I talked last week about an experience. Salvation is an experience. Great. But you don't become agape love just through that one experience. No. That experience of salvation then launches you into a lifetime pursuit of relationship with Him. And over the course of time, your capacity enlarges your ability to receive his love for you and then to give his love to other people. I talked last week about the difference between an experience and a relationship. A wedding is an experience. Marriage is a relationship. Having a child is an experience. Being a parent is a relationship. That invitation from Jesus, follow me, was an invitation, not into an experience, but it was an invitation into a relationship. You with me? Since God is the definition of agape love, the more agape love that I experience, the more I can agape love other people. The more I grow in relationship with Him, the more I will prefer the things that He prefers when it comes to the way that I treat other people. 
That's why relationship is so key. So here's the thing. Let me give you five things, and we're going we're to close. How do we grow in relationship with Him? Some of this is just basic elementary stuff, but if we don't get this, and I believe that it was intentional on the part of the Holy Spirit directing the pen of Paul as he's writing to the church at Galatia, I believe it was intentional on the part of the Holy Spirit that love was listed first. Now about faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Everything else flows out of love. And if we don't get this, if we don't understand this concept of agape and preferring the things that he prefers, we'll never be able to display the full package of who he is. So how do we grow in relationship? Number one, be in the Word consistently. You say, ah, I know that. Well, are you doing it? Are you doing it? That's one thing to know it, but are you in the Word consistently? I don't mean just on a Sunday when you show up for church that you're opening your YouVersion app or you're opening your Bible. That's not consistently being in the Word of God. Hello? So let me help you. If you're not consistently in the Word of God, let me give you a challenge. Let me give you a challenge. Go to the YouVersion app. Most of you have the YouVersion app. If you don't, it's very easy to download. Millions and millions of people all over the world have the YouVersion app, the Bible app, YouVersion is what it's called, Y-O-U version. Go to that, and there you can search Bible reading plans. And there's a Bible reading plan, if you're not consistently in the Word of God, that I want to challenge you for the remainder of the summer for 60 days. This is what it looks like. It's called 60 to start. 60 to start. If you are not consistently in the Word of God, Download your version, go to 60 to start, and I want you to consistently for the next 60 days be in the Word of God. Make it more of a priority than watching Sports Center. Make it more of a priority than catching up on your Netflix shows or the DVR recordings that you've got. Make it more of a priority than anything else. Just be in the Word of God. It's probably going to take you 15 minutes a day. That's it. Minimal investment for maximum return. Be in the Word. Number two, engage in both corporate worship, which is being in the house of God, if you're in town, be in a seat, and also your private worship. That's your personal devotional time. That's you. Pray, reading the Word, having your own worship time at home so that the this isn't the only time that you do this. This should not be the only time that you're doing this. This is awesome, but the New Testament model calls for both. It calls for corporate worship like this and individual private worship. Number three, learn to listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. The leading of the Holy Spirit. So here's what happens. As you begin to pray for others, God will begin to download His heart to you for them. And then you'll prefer what God prefers. So you, let's say you're praying for your boss. You're saying you're praying for a co-worker, you're praying for a family member, praying for a son or a daughter or a spouse, whoever it might be. As you pray for them, learn to listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit so that you really get the heartbeat of God for that person. Number four, denounce pride and be willing to be changed. Denounce pride and be willing to be changed. The reason I said that is because oftentimes when we hear a message like this, our immediate reaction or response is, well, man, that's good. There's really more applicable to somebody else because I really feel like I'm a loving person. I really feel like I'm doing well in this area. Rather than saying, God, I know there's more capacity. I know I could do this better. So I denounce pride that would say, ah, oh, you don't, you're you're good. You're good in this area. No, you denounce that pride and you say, God, if there's any more capacity in me to love the way that you would love, then I want to change. Number five, be intentional about staying in community with other believers. Intentional about that. Join a small group. Get involved in community life here at the refuge. Get on one of our I serve teams. What's going to happen is you're going to be challenged by the actions of others 
You're going to be able to encourage each other in the spirit of Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider then how we can spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Now watch this. Here's the result. Then we're going to pray. 1 John chapter 4, verse 12. We read it, but let me read it again. It says this, that when we do these things, if we love each other, agape each other, God lives in us. Watch this. And his love is brought, his agape is brought to full expression in us. That phrase, full expression in the Greek, is the word teleos. And the word teleos just simply means this fully extended, maximized, complete, fully developed. Here's the picture of teleos. You ever seen the old, maybe had one as a as a kid. I remember one time I got one at the fair when I was a little bitty boy, you know, I got some prize at the fair. It was an old pirate's telescope, you know, and you would extend it out. That's the picture of Talios. Because as we're in relationship with God, what happens is He extends us, He completes us, He maximizes us until we are at full strength. See, the more you extend that out, better you're going to be able to see. And that's the picture. He's saying if we'll do this, if we'll love others, if we'll agape others, then his agape will be brought to full expression in us. Full expression. You see, it's important that we get this. Howard Hendricks used to say this, if your love doesn't work at home, don't export. In other words, can we just really be intentional as a church to get this right, right here first? Because the Bible says that the world will know that we are followers of Christ. Not by the love that we have for them, but by the love that we have for one another. So if we'll learn to agape one another, prefer one another, prefer what God prefers, treat each other the way that God would treat that person, if you'll learn to do that with other people, not just the people you like, but if you'll learn to agape people that are different than you, people that have different political views than you, if you'll learn to agape people that are different skin color than you, what happens is God then expands your capacity and brings you to fullness, brings you to completeness. I don't know about you, but I know in my own life there's room for growth when it comes to love in the way that God would love. If you would say, I know there's room for growth in my life, come on, put your hand up right now, come on. Come on, be honest. There's room for growth in my life. Come on, put the other hand up right now, would you? Father, we just thank you today for your love for us. The only way we have any concept of love is because you first loved us. You agape us. You demonstrated your love for us. Now because of that, we've been put here on earth to agape others so that other people have a concept of who you are and of how much you love mankind because of the way we treat them. So Lord, I'm asking you today, in my own life, enlarge my capacity to love others the way that you love them. In Jesus' name. Put your hands down.